Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are just waiting for everyone to jump online tonight, but we will definitely get started. My name is Laura. I'm one of the course consultants here at Unite Health, and we run our clinical Pilates trainings here. This is Kat King. She is one of our educators on our clinical course. Um, so if you do come onto one of our trainings at some stage, you'll most likely have Kat in Melbourne. Um, and tonight we're going to run you guys through all about the clinical Pilates training that we run here at Unite Health through APPI um, and actually go through some exercises on how you can teach these to your patients or clients or whoever is really in need of them. So it's going to be a really exciting night. Make sure to stay on until the end. We do have a special announcement for everybody as well who's, who's joined us tonight. So it's really exciting. Um, but I'll let Kat introduce herself and talk about her background and everything in the, in the industry as well. Hey guys, my name's Kat. I'm a physio um, at APPI. So I've been a Pilates instructor for quite some time, even before I was a physio. I first did stop Pilates training. Then when I graduated as a physio, I did my APPI training in clinical, which was really, really good. Since then, I've done my master's in sports and exercise physio, and I work in private practice and in sport. Now, I do clinical Pilates at the clinic, but I also do injury prevention and strength and conditioning classes in uh, gymnastics and circus arts. So I actually use my clinical Pilates in uh with athletes and with the clinical population so it's really diverse and great variety for your low level client all the way up to your high level elite athlete so uh it's been a really good uh big part of my work yeah absolutely and so exciting how many different areas that you get to use it in as well which absolutely. is amazing <laughs> yeah Perfect. Um, so we'll jump in, guys, just to let you know a little bit about who we are and um, just about the courses themselves, really. So APPI really stands for the Australian Physiotherapy and Pilates Institute. So we're a leader in clinical Pilates training and have been for over 20 years. So we're an internationally recognised provider. We teach this education in over 24 other countries around the world. So it's pretty well known. Um, and we've trained over 50,000 instructors worldwide. So pretty huge number there. <laughs> all of our training and what kind of separates us from other providers out there is it has all been written by physiotherapists and designed for allied health professionals. So it's really targeting you guys specifically who are either studying to become allied health professionals or may already be working as one and looking to really add this in to complement your education and your skill set. Um, so it's, there's just so much value in it and it's just so beneficial for you to do whether you ask studying still or already working in that environment. Um, all of the anatomy and physiology is all pre-assumed knowledge, which means we can dive straight into the more practical side of things, which we'll definitely get through tonight as well. Um, so you'll be able to see how we incorporate these different pieces of equipment in our clinical courses. And the other great thing about it as well is it's something you can immediately be implementing after each level of training with us, which will make more sense once we get to the course structure and how it all works as well. Um, but you can definitely start using it straight away after attending one of our weekends of training, which is amazing. Do you want to chat through our benefits? Sure. <laughs> so as a clinician, we know that there's there's really not one condition or pathology that doesn't require clinical rehab or exercise to get someone back on track. It's actually, it's largely used in the research and largely backed. And clinical Pilates is very, very specific to our clinical uh, exercise platform. So we are re-establishing awareness of posture and good quality movement. We're just re-establishing the way people move. We're in uh, working on getting them out of pain, improving their movement quality, then getting them up to their top performance in whatever they're looking to get into with their goals. So it's very widely used across every sort of condition that you're going to come across in your clinical practice. And so it's really good to have a background in that area. Amazing. How exciting. Um, and then just to give you guys an idea about what we actually offer for trainings as well. Um, so we run the mat work and equipment certification. So there'll be 14 days of training in total with us. 
all of the education is taught to you in real time. So um, MatWork sessions, we deliver online via Zoom. So they're live, they're interactive. So you can ask as many questions as you like across those first couple of weekends. And then we have you face-to-face -face and in-person for our equipment sessions um, so that you get that interactive experience and can have access to the equipment on the courses as well. So in this 14 days of training, which by the way, we do allow you up to two years to work through. So it's really flexible. It means that you can take the course at your own pace and fit it around life commitments, work commitments, um, and sort of either slowly work towards it or get it done really quickly, whatever works best for you. Um, and you'll learn over 250 clinical Pilates movements that will range from the map the reformer, the Cadillac, the split pedal chair and the arc barrel, which a lot of this equipment we're going to show you guys tonight. Um, I'll be the, the, the patient for the evening. So Kat's going to run us through some amazing exercises that you can start using in your practice as well. So that's a little bit about our training itself. Um, we have the structure here as well. So basically the prerequisite for the training is obviously an allied health degree, but to continue through the levels, we really recommend starting with the MatWork level one. That's your kind of foundation, isn't it? That's yeah. going to set you up to then go on to these other sessions and become really successful at them. Um, so your MatWork level one is definitely the first level to start with, but the beauty of the training, the way that it's designed is once you've got that level completed, you can then work through the remaining MatWork and equipment levels in any order that you like within that two-year period. So it does give you the flexibility to just book in for dates that are suitable for you and you can work it around your schedule as mentioned as well. So, yeah, let's get stuck into some movements and exercises. <laughs> okay, great. So, guys, we're going to run through the five basic principles uh, of APPI Pilates, and then we're going to be moving into some exercises. We're going to utilise the mat, the reformer, the Cadillac, and the wonder chair today. I'm going to go through a range of different clinical settings you can use these exercises in. I'll try and mix it up so you can relate to different clinical settings in your own practice. Um, all right, let's get us started. So we, we're yes. going to set up over this way on the caddy. So beautiful, Laura. Go and lie down if you can. Let's go head up this end. All right. Now, when you first get your client in, you've got to start with the basics. The basics is really bringing attention and awareness to whole body position, and then keeping attention to those positions as we move. So. Our five basic principles will cover position as well as breathing. Um, so we know that breathing is really important in exercise. It's important, especially with deep core activation because the diaphragm is one of our deep core stabilizers. So our first basic principle that we're gonna work on today is just breathing. So Laura, just take a couple of breaths in and out. We're encouraging our clients to breathe deep and low into the bottom of our rib cage so we can really work on that di diaphragm breathing versus shallow breathing. So breath in through the nose and then out through the mouth. The most important thing in exercise is really just to make sure your client is breathing. If they're breath holding, they're likely to over recruit through the abdo region. So they might be recruiting their global abdominal muscles and then lacking activation through their deep core muscles. Deep core muscles are super important for stabilization and support through our spine and pelvis. And then we've got our global muscles. They're really good for moving, but we want to make sure the deep ones are there helping to stabilize. So breathing really helps with that. Breath holding also leads to doming. We see a lot of athletes, high level athletes, and they just don't up through their rectus when they do high level uh, or high load activities. We need to then dampen that down get them breathing is the first way to reduce their doming. All right, so we've taken a few breaths. I want you to pop your hands on the lower part of your ribcage and nice and wide. And I want you to fill up your hands with your breath. And then I want you to relax, breathing out. So Laura's doing a pretty good job at that. We're going to move on to our second basic principle, which is pelvic placement. So for lumbar pelvic stability, we want to have attention and detail to where our pelvis is in space. So pop your hands on your hips. Good. And we're just going to go out a little bit wider. So we need to first talk about finding neutral spine 
in our centering and pelvic and rib um, pelvic placement, then we're going to move on to activating our deep core stabilizers. So we know that in neutral spine, our deep core stabilizers work at their best. So they have the best length tension relationship to work. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to rock our hips back and forward. So we're gently pressing our back into the mat and then gently drawing the way, gently tucking our bottom under, gently unwinding. And to find neutral spine, we just need to find our middle point. So we've got a glass of wine balancing on our pelvis. So between our hip bones and our pubic bone, we're just tipping the wine back and forwards. And then we're finding the spot where the wine doesn't tip. It's facing up towards the ceiling. In terms of our lower back position, we want to make sure our client has the smallest space the size of a blueberry. But we want to make sure they have a little bit of pressure on the blueberry. Otherwise, they're arching too much in too much of an arch position. So to find our neutral spine, we do our pelvic rocks back and forth. And then we're looking to make sure that our pelvis is flat. We can balance a glass of wine. We're also making sure we can get a little blueberry under our lower back. It's nice to have a feel and make sure there's still a little bit of pressure in your hand, okay? So Laura's doing a pretty good job at this. Now when we're in neutral spine, we're going to talk about activation. So we want to work on activating deep core. Uh, we usually like to preset the deep core before we do any movement. So whether we're rehabbing a back, whether we're working on shoulder, hip, anything, it's still important to have a stable base. So in terms of our deep core, we've got our transverse abdominus muscles. So that's your big corset muscle that comes from the front all the way around the back and draws you in. We've talked about our diaphragm as a breathing muscle that goes down and up as we breathe in and out. Then we've got our pelvic floor, which acts like a big sling that sits underneath the pelvis, and the pelvic floor lifts up and down. We also have little muscles in the back, multifidus muscles that go between each vertebrae that are very small. We're going to talk about TA activation specifically, then we're going to talk about pelvic floor. This will complete our second basic principle, which is centering, finding our neutral spine, and then activation. So for activating TA, I want you to imagine that you've got a really tight pair of jeans and you're zipping up your tight pants and the zip is about to touch your tummy and you just got to draw your tummy gently away. So what we're doing is we're drawing our tummy in gently towards our spine. So if you think about zipping up the tight pants or if you think about a little pin that's just dropping and hanging just above your tummy, I want you to think about breathe in and as you breathe out, just drawing your tummy in nice and gently. Drawing in. If you pop your hands just in and down from your hip bone, so in an inch, down an inch, you should actually feel a gentle tightening under your fingertips when you activate your TA. So I want you to have a go again. So breathing in, as you breathe out, I just want you to gently draw your tummy in. That's good. Can you feel the tightening under your fingers? <laughs> Lovely. If someone's struggling with TA activation, or if you're more focused on, say, a women's health plan and you want to focus on pelvic floor, we can bring attention to activating pelvic floor instead of TA. We know that all of our deep core uh, stabilizers work together as a team. So if we're getting one, we're usually getting the others. So now we're going to bring attention to pelvic floor. We know pelvic floor activates it lifts up and in. So I want you to think about uh, walking into really cold water and your bathing line's about to hit the water and it's really cold. I want you to think about that drawing up feeling as you breathe. So I want you to breathe in to prepare, breathe out. Just think about that drawing up feeling through your pelvic floor. It doesn't need to be a big effort. We know our uh, deep core stabilizers are required to work a lot of the time. So it's 30% effort, guys. We don't want to see a huge difference in what they're doing. It's hard for us to know if they're doing it well. We just need to see that they can feel it with their hands and that they're centered in the right position with their neutral spine. So we're pretty happy with um, Laura's position. Now we're going to move on and bring attention to rib cage placement. Now, rib cage placement is important. In static posture, we want our rib cage to sit on top of our pelvis, directly on top, not sitting behind. Um, and when we use our arms, especially with overhead sports, we want to make sure our rib cage doesn't flare out because essentially then we're losing form in our trunk. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to get you to hold on to this bread theraband. Elbows nice and straight. Breathe into prepare, prepare. As you breathe out, I just want you to take your arms up and overhead. And I want you to just keep your ribs relaxed and down. That's good. And then bringing the arms back. Imagine that there's some springs sitting between ribs and hips. 
The length of the springs should stay the same as you bring your arms overhead. We only take the client as far as they can control. So if Laura goes all the way over, we've got our springs in the way, we might start to see a bit of rip flaring and that's where we want to work on control. Okay, so just coming down in a couple of times with our arms, watching for rib flaring, making sure we bring attention, just keeping our ribs down, keeping those springs still. And Laura's doing a pretty good job. Let's hold the arms here. Now we're going to talk about our fourth principle, which is shoulder blade placement. With shoulder blade placement, our shoulder blades have to sit flat and flush on the back of our rib cage to work in their best position. We know that everyone's got different posture of their thoracic as well as their scapular position. So we just want to make sure we can set up our client for success. So we're going to try and find our middle man here. What I want you to do, Laura, is breathe into prepare. As you breathe out, I want you to just bring your arms up towards the ceiling, letting the shoulder blades round across your rib cage. Now I want you to think about drawing your shoulder blades down and towards each other, back onto the mat, nice and flat on the mat. Breathing in and lift, down and back. So we're making sure we don't have excess upper track action here. We make sure we're not bending our elbows. We're just looking to see that we can move our shoulder blades forward and back with control. And then ideally we want them to sit flat and flush on the mat. Very nice. From here you can lower your arms. We're gonna talk about the last basic principle now, which is head and neck placement. So this might be more important for your neck pain clients or uh, maybe clients have a head forwards posture, okay, or they might have a bit of a kyphotic thoracic posture or stiffness in their upper back. Um, what I'd like you to do here is we're just going to think about where our head and neck is in space. In a um, on the mat here, we're actually looking to make sure that our forehead and our chin line up, so we're not dipping back or dropping forward. Then we're going to work on activating our deep neck flexors, so the core muscles of the neck. What I'd like you to do is just think about doing a gentle chin tuck, drawing your chin down and lengthening through the back of your neck and then relaxing out of that. Again, just like our centering, we want to make sure that we're not making a huge effort through our anterior and neck muscles. We want to make sure we're just dipping the, the neck gently and then relaxing off. So 30% effort again. You can feel on your client's um, neck so they can feel a bit of feedback from your hands as they press down so they'll feel a bit of pressure behind the back of their neck. Laura's doing a really good job at this. So now that we've discussed our five basic principles, we're going to go into some movement. Um, we're going to start with mat work but we'll be just doing it on the caddy here. So our first exercise we're going to get into Laura is called one leg stretch. Now, one leg stretch is a really, really great exercise for many clients. It can be uh, your walking or running client, or it can just be your office worker that's had back pain. Always make sure that your client's out of acute pain before you get them into uh, most of the exercises. So you don't get a raging disc patient um, doing exercise and progressing them on until you know that they're safe, um, until you can predict that they're going to be uh, low durability with these exercises. So we don't do these exercises with really acute backs or SIJ pains, okay? Make sure that they're uh, settled a bit before you get them exercising. All right, so thinking about all the basic principles we discussed, what I want you to do is find your neutral spine again. So just rock those hips back and forth a couple of times. Try and find your middle point where you have slight pressure on the blueberry sitting under your lower back and your glass of wine is sitting nice and still. Lovely. Now, this is a really good anti-rotation exercise, guys. So what we're looking for here, we're going to slide one leg out, make sure that our hips aren't rocking side to side. So what I'd like you to do, Laura, is just slide one leg out along the floor and then gently bring it back to your start position. Okay, so we want to make sure Laura's not tipping towards me as her leg slides out. We want her to anchor her opposite hip down as we slide the leg out gently and then bringing it back up. Very nice. Let's start alternating legs. Exhale, slide, inhale, back. You can imagine drawing a line across sand. If you were lying in sand, you're just drawing a nice line along the floor. Exhale, out, inhale, back. So we are doing a bit of hip pelvic dissociation here, guys. We're making sure that everything stays still up here. We're not rocking side to side. We're not losing our center. So we still check for our lower back position. Check for that blueberry. Okay, let's pause on the next one, Laura. 
Laura's doing that pretty well. We're gonna make it a bit more functional. We're gonna add uh, a different exercise in as well. First, we're gonna do it by itself. It's called overhead reach. Overhead reach brings attention to the other basic principles, rib cage placement, shoulder blade placement, head and neck placement. So inhale to prepare. As you exhale, we're just taking our arms overhead like we did before, keeping springs still between ribs and hips. And then we're gonna lower that down. Nice, we're gonna hold on to our red band just to get a bit more activity through shoulder blades. Let's make it tied up, great. Exhale overhead and inhale back. From here, Laura, what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine our one leg stretch with our overhead reach. So now we're making it a more of a coordination challenge. We're getting a little bit harder, but it's still a closed chain, low load exercise for that back patient that's recovering. From here, Laura, what I want you to do is inhale to prepare. As you exhale, I want you to take those arms overhead and slide one leg out. Everything comes back on the way back. Very nice. So we're checking for centering, keep going, swapping legs. We're checking for is our pelvis rocking side to side or is it staying nice and still? And Laura's making this look easy. But this is really functional, guys. Anti-rotation is that the hips want to drop, but we're keeping them static. So hip bones facing up to the ceiling. If your hip bones were headlights, two headlights sitting on the ceiling, nice and still. Relax, that's good. Let's further challenge Laura. So when um, we go through the levels of exercises in APPI, they do increase in load. They go from closed chain to open chain. They're very structured in their progression that will really suit your clinical client. So the low back pain patient, they're finding this uh, is going pretty well. They're feeling that they can activate their center. We're going to challenge them further. We're going to go into a bit of open chain. So Laura, on the next breath, I want you to float one leg up to tabletop. Lovely. From here, I want you to extend it out. Good. Inhale back to tabletop and then bring it back down. Very nice. Opposite side, draw tummy in, float the leg up, extending out. Draw the leg back to tabletop and then lower it down. Lovely. We can challenge Laura more with arms up, decrease the balance or decrease the stability. Um, or we could be happy just continuing what we're doing. We need to watch here for as we take the legs into open chain, hip flexor overload. So we really need to encourage that centering in TA or pelvic floor activation to make sure our hip flexors don't take over in these open chain exercises, which is often what we can see when um, patients go into these open chain progressions. Very good. Let's go into level three, one leg stretch. So now we're going to go into double open chain. So we're upping the load on the back. We're making sure our center is set. So let's draw our tummy in, zip up those tight pants, make sure those hips are square. So imagine there's a rule of balancing across your hips, keep it square. Inhale to prepare, exhale, bring one leg up to tabletop. Inhale to prepare, make sure the center is still good and bring the other leg up to join. Good. From here, what we're going to do is we're just going to extend one leg out. Good. And inhale back. Exhale out. Inhale back. Nice. We would keep going through a few reps until we see fatigue or change in form or movement quality. Laura's doing a good job. Are you still breathing? Yeah. Good. <laughs> exhale out. Inhale back. One more time on each side. Exhale, let's go a bit lower. Yep. And bring it back. Other side. Lovely. Bring it back. Very good. One leg down at a time. And you can just have a little stretch after that side to side. Very nice. So very simple exercise, a little bit of a combo, and uh, just an example of a couple of progressions. The one leg stretch, uh, we have five levels in the APPI repertoire. So you grade them up as you um, move forward with your client and you can make it more interesting adding other things in. Great, okay. So we're gonna go through uh, different exercises from different levels of the repertoire and APPI on the equipment now. We're gonna try and target different things. Um, because we're on the caddy, we're gonna use the caddy first. Now the caddy is really good. It's a static bed, but it's got the light and heavy short and long springs. It's also got a push through bar. There's a lot you can do with the caddy in a clinical setting, also with a performance athlete. So Laura, what I'd like you to do is sit up for me, swing your legs around and come up into kneeling. Good. We're gonna start working in a different plane, guys. We're gonna go into some spine twists. I'm just gonna adjust the camera a bit. 
All right, so now we're talking about our client. Maybe they're a bit stiff in their upper back. Maybe they have chronic neck pain that's under control and we're trying to get them moving. Maybe they do a rotational sport like golf or tennis, okay? So any of those clients would be suitable for this exercise. And we're actually going to go up into tall kneeling. We can do this exercise with cross legs like this. To increase the deep core challenge, I'm going to get Laura up into tall kneeling. All right, so Laura, we're going to be doing spine twists today. I'm going to pass you your strap. I want you to bring one hand, this hand in, and then interlace your fingers. Good. Bring your hands into a circle shape up by your chest. And we want to make sure that Laura isn't closing through chest and shoulders. So Laura, open through your chest and shoulders. Bring attention to that shoulder blade placement. Make sure that rib cage is stacked, stacked on top of pelvis. Head and neck are stacked on top of that. All right. So if someone needed help finding their position, we could add the magic circle in here. Now, it's really good to use props. Not only is it fun, but it really brings attention to whatever we're focusing on. Let's just bring the shoulders down a little bit, making sure the shoulders aren't reaching up towards the ceiling. Okay. So we're nice and relaxed. We've got a bit of tension in the spring. We're ready to go. From here, Laura, breath in to prepare as you exhale. I want you to just twist towards the side as far as you go comfortably, and then inhale back. You can come all the way back towards me. Good. Exhale, twist. Inhale back. We want to make sure we're doing pure rotation and we're not tipping one side to the other side. So Laura, imagine that that magic circle is actually a paella dish. Don't spill the paella. It's always good to add in visual imagery, guys. We talk about in APPI repertoire for teaching, we talk about visual imagery, which is where you get the patient imagining something. For example, the tight pants, the paella dish, the wine glass, things they can relate to. I use wine glass for people between say 18 and 50. I might use coffee for someone else if I can see they're not a wine drinker. You could go with uh, soft drinks for the younger kids. You've got to make it specific. Let's make it harder by getting rid of the circle. And let's go again. So apart from visual, visual imagery, we talk about verbal cues. Obviously you've got to tell your patient what to do. And we talk about tactile uh, cues as well. So if I see these shoulders rising up, I can just tap them and it reminds her to bring them down. I haven't said a word. We'll find out soon enough what Laura prefers for her learning method. She might respond really well to tactile and not so well to visual Im uh, verbal, verbal imagery. Visual imagery, so. Uh, so, you know, you'll get to know your client and then you'll tailor your teaching towards your client. Keep squeezing those shoulders back as you exhale already and then coming back. You should also know we have contraindications and precautions for every exercise in APPI. In our mat work that we did before, we talked about we don't do that with acute backs and SIJ pains. We have that pain under control before we go into the exercise. For our spinal rotation, again, we wouldn't do it with an acute neck or potentially even an unstable shoulder, okay? So she's doing a pretty good job. Let me have a rest there. So lots of ideas of um, clients that you could use that with. Let's move on to the reformer. Now the reformer is probably the most widely used piece of equipment for Pilates. You can do a lot of exercise variations with the reformer, um, which is why it's such a good tool. And again, you can tailor it to your low level client and your high level athlete. We're gonna go into cat arm dissociation on the reformer today. Cat arm dissociation is a level two exercise. I should have mentioned spinal articulation, spine twist on the cat is actually a level three exercise. And for our cat arm dissociation, we're actually talking about the weight bearing athlete. Okay, so we're going to be weight bearing on our shoulders. Um, it might be rehabbing someone, a weight bearing athlete like a gymnast back from a shoulder injury. Potentially, they have a history of instability, like a lot of gymnasts do. Maybe they had a bit of impingement. We've progressed them through their early band rehab. Maybe they did some rotating calf strengthening. Now we're going to give attention to scap thoracic, uh, positioning, scap stability, and good strength. So that arm dissociation. We have our springs to work with here. We can make them heavier or lighter. So I'm going to start on one red spring with more. And what I want you to do is sit, uh, sorry, up to your hands and knees. Knees touching shoulder rest and hands down on those silver bars. Okay, so we're going to look at our five basic principles again. Now we're into 
position. I love using the ball in 4.0 to help people find their neutral spine and help with their centering. Now, in 4.0, we do want a small uh, sink in the lower back. We don't want to be overarching, but we don't want to be just super flat. In our normal posture, we do have a lower daughter curve, so we do want to be just sinking down a little bit. What you can do, Laura, is your pelvic tilt in this position until you find a new spine. So I want you to tuck your tail bone under, tail between your legs, and then sticking your bottom out. Now find that middle man point. So I will sink down just another inch, and I'm pretty happy with Laura's neutral spine here. Now let's talk about shoulder blade placement. Uh, we want to make sure with our shoulder blades, again, we can do our shoulder blade isolation in our five basic principles. So squeeze shoulder blades together. Pinch your legs together, sink down to the reform a bit, and then lift up. Let them come out to the sides. Try not to move your back. We're just using shoulder blades. Squeeze and separate, shoulder blades, and separate. Very good. Then we find our middle spot. Okay, we still have our neutral spine. Up, come down an inch, and then up an inch. Yep, okay, here we go. Head placement is important too. Now, Laura's long hair, but um, what we want to look for, guys, is that we're not looking forward. It's a lot of clients look in front of them. They don't like looking at the floor. We want to make sure that we make our head sit in line with our spine, okay? We also want to make sure that the head's not dropping forwards. From here, um, shoulders are sitting just behind the hands, which is what we need for this exercise, okay? From here, Laura, inhale to prepare as you exhale, I want you to pull with your arms, keeping your hips still, bring your shoulders on top of your hands, very good, and then slowly coming back. Now, this is a lot harder than it looks, especially depending on your spring setting, okay? You've got to maintain neutral spine, pulling with your arms without letting your hips move. So you're dissociating the hips from the shoulders. Now, a lot of people um, find that they'll move their hips as well as their shoulders. They find that really hard to differentiate. Laura's doing a pretty good job. Very good. Again, we wouldn't do this with acute back pain, but it's otherwise a very good exercise for back pain because it's a neutral position. It's a four-point position, so different to lying on your back. You've definitely got to mix up the positions for your clients. And it's very easy to make it very hard or very easy, depending on your springs and your variations. We can go through a couple of different variations. So for the weight bearing athlete we talked about, we're compressing a bit of shoulder stability there and strength. Um, now we're going to bring attention to the hips. So Laura, what I want you to do is just shift your weight so your shoulders sit on top of your hands, relax through your uh, top of your shoulders. From here, uh, make it up inch forward with those shoulders. Hands back, shoulders forward. Good. And from here, Re-engage for center, so draw your tummy in. Now I want you to push with your knees to move the reformer forward and back. Very good. So now we can see we're dissociating hips from the shoulders by moving our knees instead of our shoulders, or moving our hips instead of our shoulders. So draw tummy in, exhale forward, inhale back. Exhale out, inhale back. Good. Again, Laura's doing a pretty good job. We've got to make it harder. We're gonna um, we're gonna change the base of support here. Relax, slow there. Don't let really it drop on the next one. What we're gonna do is I want you to extend this leg out towards the bar behind you. Good. Make sure your client doesn't shift over. We're gonna just stay nice and square. Imagine your hip bones and head biceps are facing the floor. We've made it a lot harder for Laura. Now I'm gonna get you to move your arms forward and back again. Just one inch foot the back. A little more than that, actually. Three inches forward and back. That's it. Let's not use our knee, let's use our arms for this one. So we could do either. We're just challenging again. You can see now it's harder for Laura to just use her shoulders. Her weight's wanting to shift to one side. So you've got to make the challenge appropriate to your client. Uh, but there are lots and lots of progressions where you can use. Laura's doing a really good job at this. It's lovely. Good. Relax. So really good for the weight-bearing athlete, really good for the back pain patient um, from low level all the way to high level. You can adjust the springs to make it easier or harder. Otherwise, there's multiple variations that we go through in APPI and these are just a couple. How did that feel? Yeah, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to a harder exercise. We're actually going to go to the one chair and we're going to go for a level four exercise. So now we're going to find out of pain. We really want to challenge them. 
This is uh, progressive abdominal strengthening as well as shoulder stabilization. It actually incorporates everything you're looking for in an athlete. So I'm going to move this out of the way so that we can see. So we don't do this exercise with acute fats, especially dysogenic pain, because this is a flexion-based exercise, a loaded flexion exercise, but we will be encouraging um, some grounding in this exercise when we come up. This exercise is called elephants, okay? So what I want you to do is place your hands on the edges of the one new chair, and then one foot at a time up onto the pedal. I've got the pedal set quite heavy to help with body weight here. Tip toes on the bar for me and lift your heels up nice and high. Safety 101 is very important in Pilates, so you always want to set your client up for success when they're getting on the equipment and when they perform the exercise. We won't leave Laura here for too long, but you can add a grip mat to the feet here so they don't go sliding. And when they do get onto the one chair, you want to make sure they don't squash their other foot with that pedal. So just be mindful of that. All right, thinking about our five basic principles, we're going to engage through our tummy. What we're going to do is we're going to bring our weight into our arms, and I want you to lift the pedal up, rounding your back and your hips as high as you can up to the ceiling, and then slowly coming back down. This exercise again is much harder than it looks. Lifting up high, send those hips to the ceiling, bringing it back down. So we're trying to make a banana or a rainbow shape uh, with our trunk. As we lift up and then lowering back down. Laura, again, doing a very good job at this. Let's do three more Laura. rounding up, hips as high as you can go. Lift, lift, lift. So giving a little bit of assistance, but position wise, I think she's doing really well. And relax. And you can help your client off by holding the pedal so that they go climb. That's it. I'm going to show you a couple of other variations in elephant that you can do on your one chair. The one that you have to really because it's so close, you know, obviously we can do a lot of sitting exercises on the one chair, but really good for elephant for those high level, uh, high level clients that you have that you want to do that progressive strengthening with in weight bearing position. What we can do on the one chair is we can split the pedal, all right? So the pedal does come into two parts. So we can do our elephant again, where we lift up, and then we can make it functional to say running or any sport when we're using our legs, okay? So we can do some running on the elephant exercise. If we bring the pedal back in, I'm gonna show you a couple of other variations where we then target obliques. So obliques obviously work together to come forward, but we can bias one side versus the other, which is important for different sports, as we know. So all those rotational sports really important. Also important though for anti-rotation sport. So all you can do here is just twist to face one way. Some people like to go all the way to one side of the wonder chair to make it a diagonal uh, elephant. Otherwise, you can really keep things in the middle. Just twisting your hips. So we've got our side elephants here. We can also work on bending knees to chest, bending knees to chest. So not so much focusing on the articulation through our back, rounding through our back, but holding our back more steady and moving our legs, knees to chest. So just a couple more variations for you there. So that's just a little taster of some of the exercises that. Uh, we do on the courses in APPI. Yes, thank you for dealing with us moving things around so we could show you guys all the different types of equipment that we teach on the course as well. <laughs> um, but I suppose, Kat, could you maybe explain it to everyone like a case study or like maybe some a situation where clinical Pilates has really benefited one of your patients or, or yourself? Absolutely. So I personally have done a lot of clinical Pilates. I don't have injuries per se, but I do run. Um, and you have to uh, you have to have some level of strength and conditioning and body awareness and control, motor patterning to be able to maintain exercising without getting injured. So uh, whilst we have a large emphasis on injury management, don't forget about injury prevention and clinical Pilates. That's probably where I use most of my clinical Pilates with athletes. I'm not saying that they're not injured. There are some that have ongoing injuries that we're managing, but they train 30 hours a week 
And the ability for someone to be able to train those hours, they have to have a good base. They have to have body awareness. They have to have good motor patterning. They have to know what they're doing when they're loading and load correctly and stack correctly. So um, Pilates has been integral to my work in terms of injury prevention. Now, of course, I use it for injury management as well. As I was saying before, I don't have one client that I don't find suitable for clinical Pilates. Now, the only thing I can really think of is a wry neck. An acute wry neck might not be your, your first client to take into clinical Pilates, but everyone else, research is strong into the exercise-based rehab. Clinical Pilates utilizes the uh equipment the pilates equipment and the equipment's very uh it's very set to make clients work well to support them or to make them very challenged so it's a very safe way to exercise someone from low level to high level uh old and young and often clients enjoy using the equipment as well but it's good to note all of the equipment is based off mat work exercise as well so mat work is also very important most of your clients won't have equipment at home so they have to have a base of mat work you have to give them home exercises that cross over with what you're trying to achieve with them in your classes i love taking clinical pilates because i'll see a client one-on-one -on -one. I'll be managing their home program, but I want to watch them exercise and make sure they're moving well. So it means that I have the ability to correct them and progress them along uh, without having to see them on going one-on-one -on -one for a long time. And a lot of injuries we see, we manage over a long period of time, like arthritis, for example. Um, you have to have a strong base to function at a high level with arthritis, whether we're talking about hip or knee or any other joint. Um, it's something that your clients will appreciate doing in the long term. So you'll have your short term clients that you progress back from injury, like an ACL, and they get back to their sport and they may or may not want to maintain their clinical Pilates classes as a base. But then you'll have clients that come every week. Um, they might have tendon pathologies, so they need to have a base of strength. They might have arthritis or joint issues, and those joint issues aren't going to change structurally. Functionally, for them to be feeling good, um, they need to keep that base of Pilates up, and often exercise in a clinical setting is the best way to do that. Exercise at the gym is great uh, if you trust that your client moves really well without prompting, and often you might have clients coming in at 50 and they've squatted a different way for 50 years and you've got to reteach them to squat. And I don't trust that client to load up at the gym safely. I want them to exercise with me in clinical Pilates. So we can make it very hard and suitable level for them. And we are assured that our client's exercising safely. So in terms of uh, structural, we're stuck with what we have injury-wise, but functionally we can really see a person change from here to here. Um, you know, if we scan 100 backs, we're going to see lots of things come up, some things that are um, not relevant and some that are. So it's really about how do they move? What are their motor patternings like? What's their awareness like? And how can we maximize that to achieve their goals for that client? Yeah, absolutely. I can even say from my own personal experience how much clinical Pilates has helped me. I had a prolapse C5-6 disc in my neck and clinical Pilates like once I got out of that acute pain stage it was honestly the thing that got me back to living day-to-day -day life um, it's why I work in the industry now because I fell in love with it so much and just was amazed after years and years of of going to, you know, really expensive specialists and spending money elsewhere. Um, when I discovered clinical Pilates and I had that program and that set out for me, the differences I saw in my ability to move my neck, the, the chronic pain I was in, everything just really died down. And I was like, oh, everything feels good again. So it just had such a massive impact on my life. But I know that so many people that I speak to day to day, particularly working in this industry, industry, how much it's helped them as well. So I think it's amazing for any allied health professional to have this education behind them um, to really best assist your clients and patients. Absolutely. You want to empower your patient to be independent and successful. You're setting them up for success. Passive therapies only get people so far and people can become reliant on them. Um, and just as we've said before in the research, clinical exercise and Pilates is the way to go forward for your client in the long term.
Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose we'd like to open up to some questions as well. If any of you are sitting at home and really would like to ask, um, well, Kat, I suppose, um, any questions about clinical Pilates or any of the exercises and movements that we just covered, um, please pop them in the Q&A or wherever the chat, if you can see it there. And we'll be happy to chat through that as well, just to answer any questions, as well as any course questions as well. I mean, you, we definitely can run through um, the course in more detail if that's something you guys would be interested in covering tonight as well so let us know if any questions come through um yes absolutely so someone has just sent through does the course offer teaching groups as well um in the clinical training with appi we'll go through teaching one-on-ones small groups and larger groups as well so you can kind of adapt that to everyone is that right Absolutely. We do discuss program planning after um, we go through assessment and then we'll discuss the intro of a class, the body of a class and the cool down of a class. So we can um, really link that into your clinical setting and how you're going to use your Pilates. So I use my Pilates, Pilates in a clinical setting, but I have also use it in a group setting, as I was saying, with fitness, where everyone does the same thing at the same time versus clinical where I'm treating a shoulder rehab patient, a back pain patient, a hip tendon patient at the same time. They have their own individual programs. Then you've got your group that you're happy to um, run through the same exercises with. So we absolutely go through the program planning that would be suitable for that. Yeah, definitely. And we always get asked that question as well. If I do the clinical course, can I teach the general healthy population? So absolutely the answer is yes. You can definitely teach both because you will have the skills to do that. The cost of a certification. So we are coming to that. I will get to that point tonight. Um, we do have a special offer for everyone that has come along tonight as well. So I'll share that with you guys. Um, where would we be suited for work after the course? Will you be able to work at a hospital to rehab patients? Absolutely. So some hospitals have reformers now, which is really cool. Um, I guess when things first kicked off, it was very private practice focused and private practice and clinical Pilates uh, set out. But in hospitals now, they do have Pilates equipment and it's an advantage for you to have training. Um, I must say it's an advantage for everyone and it sets you apart to have your clinical Pilates accreditation. I find it very hard to teach someone uh, both clinical reasoning and repertoire. So if someone already has that background, they're an asset to their, their job and it will improve your career prospects. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely something, particularly post-COVID times as well, that we're seeing more and more of that private practices really want to take on, um, you know, new grads that have already put that time in and have got that training behind them. So if you are a student, um, it's definitely worthwhile looking into at least making a start. As we mentioned at the start of tonight, you have two years to work through the certification. So even if it's something you do alongside the final years of your degree, it's definitely recommended. And when you do look for employment, they'll be able to see you've already made a start or perhaps finished it. So it looks really good on the resume as well. Yeah, the other thing is uh, being able to teach over Zoom is an asset and being hands-off in your career is an asset. So as a clinician, you might be very hands-on and you're not going to be able to sustain that for 50 years or have, however long you feel like working for. It's a good adjunct, not only because it matches up with the clients that you're going to be seeing, but also it will sustain you in the long term in your career. Amazing. Yeah, that's such a good point actually as well, isn't it? Um is the course suitable if done a bachelor in exercise and sports science? Absolutely. We would love to see you on the training. It's perfect for you guys. And again, expanding in your yeah. knowledge because you'll have a really a grounded exercise background. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how you bring that into your practice. But it's it's a very different perspective on the same sort of thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Keep the questions coming, guys. I'm more than happy to run over them and, and definitely make sure that you guys have got everything out of tonight's session that you were hoping for. Um, I suppose, Kat, as well, like what would you think, what would you say separates APPI's methods yep. compared to maybe other 
courses or education that's out there because yeah, the industry is really unregulated, right? So there's that's so many right. different providers. So what yeah. do you reckon is the best part about, I guess, the API methods? Well, apart from being internationally recognised, which is attractive for people that want to work overseas, um, I found it very beneficial in terms of the clinical reasoning, bringing that into their practice, I found very helpful for work. Um, as I said before, I've done training elsewhere. And whilst it was helpful, it wasn't, uh, I'd say, as structured in terms of that clinical setting, which I find really important. And that's what why we have a clinical and a fitness stream. And so if you're using it in your clinical practice, you can't just have a set of exercises if you don't know how to apply them. So being able to um, clinical reason and adjust and modify and progress those clients through different exercise repertoire is really important. And I found that sets things apart. I also found that whilst directional bias is something to consider with some pathologies, for example, discogenic pathologies, some other courses might be very centered around directional bias. There's more of an open view to the pathology around that on APPI. So it's very research-based as well, which I find is very important. So I base my clinical practice on a mix of um, experience research and just client expectations and client feedback and I find the research part you just can't miss it because you don't want to be doing the same thing you did 15 years ago or when you see clinicians that are a bit older they might have got stuck into their patterns you want to keep up with the research and you want to be able to justify what you're doing and why so if you're teaching a client an exercise and say why am I doing this or why do I have to do this to be able to do footy you know you have to have a good answer you have to keep your client engaged you have to set their expectations and you have to have a background in knowledge as to why so you come in with a clinical background with your backgrounds but we bring the research uh, evidence base into what we're doing to help you um, use the APPI repertoire. Yeah amazing and that's sort of covered in a bit of the like case studies that we do as well isn't it? Absolutely so we do talk about case studies we can make them specific to the clients you see so we see People come through here that uh, in women's health, hospital settings, sporting settings, uh, lots of different areas, geriatrics, and we want to target and set up cases for all clients that we're going to interact with because uh, we often see a different, a big range, a big variety. So we go through case studies along the way. We talk about applying those case studies to all of the equipment. Uh, so we, we're keeping the um, the break, the range broad so you're able to apply it in any workplace you might not have everything in a workplace I didn't have an arc barrel at my clinic for a while um you know so you've got to work with what you've got as well yeah absolutely and I, I guess that's a, a really great part of the equipment is yes you're learning all all of all pieces but you're going to be able to take away from that with what you do have and be able to modify and adjust to to use all of these movements and exercises on all of the pieces of equipment, which is really great. Yeah. Perfect. Well, if no one has any other questions, I will just share with you our special announcement. I think I accidentally clicked over to it earlier anyway. Oh, where's my <laughs> screen gone? I will just open it up two seconds. Seem to have lost it. <laughs> That's okay. We will. Oh, here it is. Beautiful. Sorry, guys. Always hard on Zoom. Great. So someone asked earlier about the costings. Um, so we have just launched a winter hype sale. You guys are the first to know about it on a clinical setting. So um, this course is available to book now. As we mentioned earlier, the mat work level one is the first course to start with. So that's coming up on the 1st and 2nd of July. So that will be the start date you'll be aiming towards. Um, and then you can continue through the remaining levels over that two year period. With the sale today, um, our regular price is around about the 6-3 mark and we've just heavily reduced it by $1,900. So 
the upfront cost is 4,495 in total, and that will include your 14 days of training, all of your course materials and manuals and your certification assessments at the end of the course as well. So it's going to give you that ability to work through this over that two years and be able to fit it around your own schedule with life and work commitments, um, which is really great. So as soon as you've done mat work level one, that's going to set you up to then continue with the remaining of the levels. So if you would like to maybe talk about this in more detail, you can definitely book a time to chat with me or one of the team members through our website. Um, otherwise, you can just enroll directly online. You do also have the option when enrolling to actually select TBC, so to be confirmed for future levels. So if there's some dates that you might have prior commitments on or you're busy, you can just TBC and they'll be available on your portal to book in at a later time. And we'll constantly have new intakes coming out as well. Um, sorry, Leanne, we've just seen your question here. Um, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yes. So Leanne's question is, is the course suitable for a retired physio wanting to skill up as Pilates instructor for general public? Absolutely. What would set you apart, Leanne, is that in the general public, there will still be people that can't do everything. So in your class setting, you'll be able to modify and progress different clients in your class, even in a group setting. So it's just that it's that clinical background and high level knowledge, but as well as you will learn a lot of exercise repertoire. So you can go through the mat work if you're thinking about general public mat work classes, or it might be more equipment focused for you. Um, that you'll get both the exercise repertoire as well as the clinical reasoning behind each exercise. Yeah, great. Um, yes, so whoever asked about Mat Work Level 1 to TBC, if you would like to secure the offer but you're not ready to start just yet, feel free to jump on the website and TBC all the levels, add the course to your cart. And once you've made payment with the Winter Hype sale, those levels will be available on the back end on your portal, ready to book when you're ready to start the training. So absolutely, you can definitely go about it that way if you would like to. Great. Well, we're nearly at the end. It's been such a great hour to share with you all. Thank you so much for attending tonight. And hopefully you gained some really beautiful insight as to why clinical Pilates is so important um, and why we love what we do as well. <laughs> so do always reach out. Please book a time to chat with the team um, if you'd like to know more about the trainings and start dates and everything else. Um, but we really do hope to see you on a course with us soon. And if you're in Melbourne, most likely you'll get to do some training with Kat, which will be really exciting. So we would love to see you on the courses there. I will stay on just in case anyone has other questions that they would like to ask. So um, feel free to keep popping them through the, the chat. But thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kat, and running us through all of that amazing education. Um, I already feel like a bit better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hopefully I, I meet some of you guys in future. Definitely. Absolutely. So I'll stay on guys. Let me know if there's any questions, but thank you so much for attending tonight. And we can't wait to see you on the courses with us soon. Bye. Bye.